So, um, welcome to the unofficial, unapproved version of Between Two Ferns. <laughs> is this rolling? <laughs> it's rolling. This is, this is real. I'm going to have emails from Zach and his lawyers in about 10 seconds. So, this is, uh, this is Mike, and we've been working together on and off for I don't know how many years, six years in the field, I guess, seven years. A while. We've been bumping into each other at conferences in the beginning. We've been working together on projects. And we've basically both been knee deep in governance around open source. And I wanted to just take this opportunity at the end of this legal network event to ask you about how you got in here. I mean, what form of insanity drew you into this dark field of complexity? That's a tough question. I wouldn't say it was one thing. I can give you a softball question. What's your favorite color? Blue. All right. Now we're back to the first question. What brought you into this dark field of insanity? <laughs> I would not say it's one thing that brought me in. I'd say it was a series of events. Or uh, mistakes. Or mistakes. Yeah. Uh, I started programming when I was young. wasn't very good at it. But I was decent enough. I uh, grew up through right about the dot-com era and uh, had a lot of opportunity on the technology side. But I was always interested on the technical or on the legal side, and so uh, when I was in college, I got introduced to Linux, and Linux led to other things, and uh, getting involved in looking at what's going on in the free software movement and the open source movement at the time, and then about '99 or so, I you know big companies started coming in like IBM's and others, and that was a, a moment when I was entering law school and. Um, I said, hmm, maybe I can do something around uh, open source uh, legal issues uh, as I'm working on my studies in law. Uh, I finished uh, law school, went right into a business school MBA program because I also saw in that time, uh, as I was working at law firms, the intersection between legal decisions and business management decisions. And um, I started to see how the decision making went about and where things were resolved. And I actually started to think the strategy around what you're doing as a business was, was, was uh, much more interesting. And so I actually uh, went through uh, an MBA program. And after that, I went right into IBM, working in the Linux uh, strategy team that they had uh, set up at the time that looked at the cross IBM portfolio and what they were doing in Linux and open source. And that was just how I first started getting into it. And that's a really good answer. I mean, I was I was hoping for something like I was. Well, I made it up. Yeah. Oh well, that's okay. <laughs> I, mean, I was hoping for I was drunk and I wandered into the wrong room. But if you just made it up, I'm mean, willing to accept that. I think that was your story, wasn't it? That was my story. Uh, <laughs> it was pretty close. Uh, so I mean, for me, actually, the very short version was that uh, I, I was messing around with uh, FreeDOS. Oh. Which yeah. Yeah, I, I had such a old computer, it couldn't even install Linux, so I installed FreeDOS. I did that one time, then I didn't. <laughs> I did that once, and I, I, then I did it on my real computer later in college, and I lost all my data. Yeah. I, it was probably due to, and I like, I like to uh, confess to my sins, it was due to the error, uh, you know, space was the keyboard, the chair, there was something in between those items that led to complete destruction of data. Mm. Yeah. Okay, but moving on from that my happens. beautiful life. Uh, You've been in this field squillions of years. You're one of us old men in, in the field. At, are we old now? We, we are, look at our gray hair. It's not going well for us. <laughs> Can we color correct no. on the camera? We're, we're not going to color correct, and we're not going to edit that one out. We're going to face the truth, man. We're going head on here. But uh, I'm facing the truth. You're <laughs> Don't interrupt my flow. I'm it's getting to the first. question. <laughs> it, I'm getting to the question. The question is, all these years, all of that long time playing here, you've, you've, you've seen a lot of interesting stuff with the business side, the legal side. What's been the most interesting thing in open source law that you've encountered? The most interesting thing in open source law. And you can't answer nothing. I think the most interesting thing was SCO versus IBM. Oh, yeah. I'll be honest that I, I was at IBM at the time. I'll limit what I say, but um, you know, there's a number of things that happened around that SCO lawsuit that I think were important. One was that there was one company involved and another company involved, and you could argue that right. the community could have just let those two companies fight, but they didn't. It, it, the community came together as antibodies. Yeah. 
because they recognized this issue that was SCO and how important it was to the perpetuation of open source and free software contributions and, and being able to use that code. And it wasn't just IBM, it was you know, Grok Law, it was everybody around the whole legal sphere of what was going on that you know, there was a little bit of you know, popcorn moments where you're watching you know, what's oh, yeah. going on in the legal briefs, but uh, at the end of it, if you look back at what happened, it was, it, it was really the first FOSS immune system that took out the major potential issue. And that was that was somewhere around ninety eight, ninety nine, I guess. Well, it was oh, early filed, but I think yeah, we were watching it all the way through. I, I don't even know if it's still over. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, well, <laughs> because of all the uh, bankruptcy, uh, like everything else. It that lumbers afterwards. on. Yeah. Well, I do, I do remember, uh, and you, you, I do remember it happening. What's interesting for me when you said antibodies and the community flocked around it, is that. The depth of perception, if you were doing open source in any way, you got to hear about this case. Um, at that time, I was in college, and mm -hmm. I heard about it. I started following it. And when you think about that, I started following Grok Law because of this case between two yeah. large corporations. Yeah. Unheard of. Yeah. How, yeah. Many, how many Grok Laws have spun up? Yeah. And then Grok Law also started to you know, talk about other things beyond just the IBM SCO case, right. which started to bring an interest in sort of you know, the legal consequences of licensing and open collaboration sharing. Um, and so you know, that was all interesting to me at, at that time in particular. And here I am. I guess that was the first great intersection of the traditional community and the corporate interests and everybody aligning and saying, we need this to work. Yeah, it was. It, it was. Uh, uh, it's arguable that the community could have taken a hit uh, yeah. if IBM had lost that case. Uh, it was important for them. They put a lot of investment in terms of legal, engineering, technical um, resources into that, and ultimately they prevailed, and it, it benefited the entire community. And I think there's actually a lot of that where companies do things, whether it's behind the scenes or you know in public, where they are working on continuing to protect and make right. sure that this ecosystem is whole. Because now they have major businesses that are dependent on this, and so you know when somebody tries to do something nefarious or funny or try to rewrite the rules to advantage themselves, you know there is that that antibody ecosystem. Though you know a billion dollar lawsuit lawsuit over. <laughs> Go was obviously better headlines. <laughs> it was a little bit noticeable, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, then moving forward, because uh, we don't want to stay in the past too long, where we originate, we want to look forward to those new snappy young generations, those people who are just growing their first beards and thinking about buying their first uh, Teslas, which neither of us will ever buy because they're expensive, but the Silicon Valley <laughs> super kids can buy five. Maybe they'll make a cheap one. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for the cheap one, and I'm, I'm not bitter at all about those 22-year-olds with the $400,000 salary. I feel good about that. I think young people should have a chance. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway, the future. And uh, you're one of the people I think that's pretty well positioned to actually look at the future and think, well, I can't predict it, but I might be able to see some trends or there might be some things I'm looking for. And in the next 12 to 24 months, is there stuff that you'd say we should keep our eyes open for, that you're keeping your own eyes open for? I, I think there's a few things, uh, I'll categorize it maybe under a theme of there are trends that we're looking at now that are not so much focused on affecting the next 12 or 24 months. What we're seeing interest in right now is we've been at this for 25, 30 years, almost some people. Uh, how do we take this out the next 30 years, the next 50 years even? Uh, because open collaboration has become a part of R&D. It's become part of how software is built. It's become part of how we learn about software in academic environments. And this is not going away. And so what are the right societal, policy level, um, community level governance structures that will help uh, maintain this in a, in a way that we can you know, start to rely on this in the long term. We have some companies who are looking at putting in Linux into devices that are part of the social infrastructure in uh, electric systems and power plants that don't change out every two years, five years, ten right. years. 
how do you maintain something like this for the 30 year term that that device is going to be sitting in a power plant? Those are some of the, the key, you know, sort of long term issues. I'd say on the legal side, we also have issues around, um, you know, what to do about how uh, the licenses that we have grown to use, adopt, love, and proliferate, how do they uh, become part of a continuous cycle around end user adoption, but also making sure that we have people coming back into the community and not just taking what is being produced by this great community and going off and exploiting it for themselves in some sort of uh, way that diverts from the licensing or community norms. And so there we're looking at things structurally at a, almost like a industry policy level around open chain. And uh, yeah, I was going to bring up have open you heard chain. of open chain? Uh, you know, um, as the program manager of open chain and the chair of curriculum of open chain and the person who was in the room when open chain was proposed, um, I, I was going to suggest that open chain might be something we might talk about and endorse <laughs> uh, <laughs> just to a small degree. So you've heard of it? Uh, I heard of it vaguely, question. but you should, probably tell, you should tell me more I about open sure chain because I don't know if it's really awesome. Wait, I thought you're or, the program manager. Maybe you should. Well, you know, it, it, would sound like, it would sound bad if I endorsed my own open chain project, uh, so, so you should probably I, endorse it.